Again, Father, what a privilege it is that you have called us to come, to come before you with thanksgiving, thanking you for the life and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you looked and you knew and you prepared us that we could be like you through Jesus. When we believe by faith in him, we are indwelled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I just thank you that you care enough to call us, to give us that second chance, just like you're going to give Jonah. Father, we come to submit ourselves to you. We want to lift up our prayer now as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is
Wasn't that beautiful? It got good. We just heard the goodness of God right through these folks. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. What a privilege it is to be a part of a body of believers and a body of believers that can sing. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Pastor Bill asked if I could cover for him today, and if I would and felt led to carry right on into Jonah, chapter 3. And so that's, that's what we'll do. I'll, I'll not be as... Uh, Pastor Bill can just tell a story, you know, and, and, and me. Here's our history lesson. Here's our geography lesson. So you, you'll just have to put up with that with, with me, okay? I had mentioned earlier... Oh, and let me just say this, too. It's so good to look out and see some that have been sick and hospitalized and back with us uh, this morning. Thank you for coming on to church today and worshiping our Lord and Savior together. Thank you. Well, at the men's breakfast, I was telling you earlier, uh, one thing that I like to order is called the light eater. Oh, my goodness, it's, it's a trough. I mean, it's a plate that comes out that's... <laughs> It's got uh, two scrambled eggs on it, and it's got three pieces of bacon. It's got two pieces of toast that are, that are cut diagonally. You know toast tastes better when it's cut diagonally? But, <laughs> of course, it may help with all that butter they slab all over it, but still, it's, it's delicious breakfast. It is. And, you know, and our waitress, you don't see the bottom of your coffee cup or, or orange juice or water, whatever you're drinking. It's, it's a wonderful time. A couple of the problems that we solved yesterday was that when you go camping in the mountains, you need to be aware of bears. Some of our men experienced bears on their camping experiences. Uh, one left his car door open and the bear got in the car. Uh -huh. See how exciting we are? Men, you have to come on and join us. And then we talked about old pickup trucks and uh, the, oh, how wonderful old blue is and then how, how the old... Uh, Chevy, that, that, that one of the men said, we just prayed that the inspector never lifted up the floor mat because you could see the front tire in, uh, underneath it there. So well, when it gets a little warmer, we'll get into some projects. But while it's still cool, we'll, we just have a great fellowship time together. And all of that says and leads us up to Jonah chapter 3 by saying that breakfast is over and it's time to go to work. It's time to go to work. As we have been studying under uh, Pastor Bill, and he led us last week, that Jonah has a first chance, if you will. God told Jonah to get up and to go to Nineveh and to preach repentance to the Ninevites. So here comes one of our geography lessons. Jonah doesn't want to do it. You ever said no to God? No, I never told God no. <laughs> yeah. Anytime we say, I can't stand up to pray, that's telling God no. I can't read scripture or I can't speak to someone about the Lord. I'm too nervous or I'm, I'm afraid. That's, that's really saying no. Well, so what Jonah did to drive home his no is he went to the port city of Joppa there on the Mediterranean coast in Israel and booked the cruise to Tarshish. And Tarsus, if you would look on the, on the map at Spain, at the bottom part of Spain, you, you see that little rock of Gibraltar that kind of sticks out? And on the left side of that rock of Gibraltar is, is the town of Tarsus. Well, Tarsus, and if you go back to where Nineveh was, as Pastor Bill was telling us, was 3,000 miles. Why did he book a cruise to Tarsus? As I understand it, that was the furthest known land, the furthest civilization in the known world. <laughs> to them, at that time frame, you couldn't go any further than Tarsus. That was the end of the world. Jonah is saying, I'm getting so far away from God, he can't find me at the end of the world. You think God doesn't know what the end of the world is? He knows, he knows when it's going to occur, too. <laughs> But that's what Jonah is saying. Now, I wonder why he had this attitude against Nineveh. Well, I think first he believed, like his countrymen, that God was only the God of the Hebrews. 
that he didn't belong to anyone else. And only when Jonah is down inside the whale's belly did he come to realize that salvation is not based on who you're kin to, but it's based on God and God alone. God gives us salvation through Jesus Christ, does he not? Absolutely. And it's up to God to who, can, who wants to be saved. All are saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All will be saved. Absolutely. And I think the second reason, not only that God belonged to, to the Hebrews, but I think Jonah thought he was very bitter and resentful. Uh, he was afraid of the Ninevites, really. Um, the history tells us that they were very warring people, and, and, and they conquered a lot of people. And when they conquered people, they would take their captives and skin them alive. Can you imagine? You, you, you can't survive that, the rawness of your flesh. You imagine how it feels when you, when you skin your, your, your knuckles up. Having the whole body that way. They would gouge out the eyes of their prisoners. They would lead their prisoners around with little hooks in their nose. Can you imagine being pulled with a hook in your nose? And if that weren't bad enough, then they would dismember the body and take the skull and leave the skull outside the city gates so that anybody coming into Nineveh would see all these skulls thrown all around and up the wall that they knew to behave themselves or your skull would wind up right out here too. Jonah says they don't deserve to be forgiven. They don't deserve to repent. All they deserve is God's punishment and God's death. Well, Jonah runs. And if you remember when he was running and he got on the cruise ship and the crew threw him overboard and God sent the whale to scoop him up, to swallow him. Remember how Pastor Bill was telling us all the content of that stomach and, oh, and it, was just, it was just terrible. Pastor Bill did a great job. He did. He, and Jonah got spit up onto the shore and he was surrounded with seaweed all over his head. I, I asked uh, uh, David and, 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 and uh, Riley have helped me, so I'm going to walk over this way. This is very out of character for me to walk out of the pulpit. But you see this beautiful choir right here? We think that the sperm whale, who still lives in the Mediterranean, see today and along that Spanish coastline and along the French coastline there, the sperm whale has a throat that's 20 feet long. So that's from this back wall here where Neil and the men are sitting up to where Gene, Gene stand up just a minute. Yeah, that's, that's where, that's how long his throat, how long is your throat? About that long? That's the sperm whale's. Then, stay standing just a minute. Here. Now, the width is 15 feet. That's over there on the wall where the choir is. To coming to the cross, that's about 15 feet. And he's nine feet tall. That's almost up there to where that arch is. Our choir just got swallowed. <laughs> just got swallowed up. You know, behave yourself. <laughs> so, okay, thanks, Gene. I appreciate that. All right, so... That's large enough for an 18-wheeler to get in. That's large enough to put a mobile home in. Now, the marine biologists tell us that there's air in the stomach of the whale, but it, 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 it registers 104 degrees. So you're trying to breathe 104 degree temperature. I don't, I don't know how that works. You know, but what I did know, and I was sharing with Donna today that dawned on me, that Jonah paid the money to get on that ship to go to Tarsus, and God gave him a free ride back, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he sure did. He gave him a free ride back. And we know that it's a whale because the Bible says it was. Jesus himself said in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, referring to the whale, but our focus isn't on the marine biology and on that size. I just wanted to illustrate to you that whatever God wants to do can happen. And he can use his own creation 
to allow it to happen. And so what I want us to focus on is on the worship and on the study of the Word of God. You know, so Jonah's down in the stomach of this whale, sperm whale perhaps, and, and gets spewed back out. Gets vomited, the Bible says, onto the shore. Seaweed all over him. If I was Jonah, I'd have quit right there. I'd just quit. If I'd have been God, I'd say, I'm going to look for another prophet. I'm not going to mess with this one anymore, but thanks be to God. God's not like me, and he's not like you either. He's higher and loves all of us and wants all of us to come into his family. So to prove the love of God, let's look now at the scripture and pick up at chapter 3, if we would. Uh, the Bible's there in front of you to pick, pick one up, if you would. Jonah, chapter 3, the first two verses. Jonah's... Jonah's, Jonah's in the minor prophet section, back toward the back of the Old Testament. Not because what he said was minor, but because the, the length of what he said is short. That's why it's classified as a minor prophet. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim, it to, the mes and proclaim to it the message I give you. The message that I give to you. Here comes Jonah's second chance. Look at verse 1. See, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. The book of Jonah is not about the whale. And it's really not about Jonah. Every book of the Bible, if you get stuck, always remember it's about revealing the love of God. It's about revealing the love of God. How is God being demonstrated in this book? In Jonah, he's being demonstrated as a God who loves us and allows us to repent and gives us a second chance. God never gives up on us. God is gracious and he is forgiving. I wonder, do you, do you and I find it hard to give people a second chance? Sure we do. You know, as long as they're, they're being a friend the way I want them to be a friend, as long as they're, they're acting the way I want them to act, we're good friends. But boy, if somebody says something to upset me, you know, what's that phrase? I... I can forgive you, but I can't forget. Yeah, that's not forgiving. Forgiving is you don't hold it against them and you don't remember that anymore either. You don't let that influence you. Jonah is stubborn. He's just plain old stubborn. It's my way of interpreting the faith and it's nobody else's way. God, you can't speak to me a different way because this is what I've always been taught and this is the way I've always done it. Jonah's stubborn. People that are stubborn help, help my spiritual walk to grow stronger. I just I have a hard time with that. But the Lord helps me. He says, bud, not everybody's perfect like you. I said, well, they need to try to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But God, God does not give up on stubborn people. God has many examples in the Bible of giving people second chances. Think about King David. Oh, and everybody loved King David and wanted to follow King David. And then he fell into the lustful sin. And through the pain and agony of being led to repentance and coming back to God and God forgiving him, then his reign as King David became even more productive to the end of his life. Think about Samson. I think of Samson, he would, he would fit today's modern uh, social media. And Samson was rugged and he was handsome and he was popular until he had that lustful time. And God led him to a second chance through repentance. And Samson repented of his sin of turning away and revealing what God said was for him to know. And the Lord led him to those pillars of the temple and he pushed on those pillars and he killed more Philistines in that one, that one moment than he had at any point of his life. Because he had repented. Think of Simon Peter. Even, did you know that Simon Peter's father was named Jonah? Remember Simon? Simon Peter's son of Bar-Jonah? Yeah, the son of Jonah. That's how important this Jonah in the Old Testament has become in the New Testament. Jesus referred to it several times. Peter's father's name named Jonah. But if you remember, Peter denied the Lord three times that night when Jesus needed him the most for comfort. But yet, there on the shore of Galilee after the resurrection, he said, make sure Peter comes. 
I've forgiven Peter, and Peter goes on to be the leader of the early church. We think of the woman at the well. She was living in adultery, and Jesus spoke salvation to her. She repented, and she went in and got her whole town to come out and to listen to Jesus. You see what repentance does? It changes us. It changes us. Apostle Paul persecuting and killing the early Christians because he, he thought they were heretics to the Jewish faith. And when he met the Lord on the Damascus Road, the Lord gave him a second chance. And Paul, Paul repented and changed and became the missionary to the Gentiles. That's you and me. We have the Bible today because of Paul's missionary journeys. Since God uses people in sinful conditions, I think he can certainly use us and give us a second chance. Maybe someone's here today and they need a second chance. Maybe you're, you've been wandering and ser searching. God's going to give you a second chance in just a moment to, to come forward. But Jonah is given a sacred charge now. Look at the sacred charge that he's given. Verse 3 and 4. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day Jonah started into the city, he proclaimed 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. All right, do we see that word there? You see the phrases there? See, God, God never changes his will. God never changes. If he changes, then he's not dependable. His word is not trustworthy, and we know it is. We know that God's word is trustworthy. So he comes to Jonah the second time with the sacred task, take my word to Nineveh. He's just survived three days in, in the belly of that whale. Who has a testimony like Jonah? I don't have a testimony like Jonah. I grew up in a Christian home. I was blessed. My dad went into the ministry when he was 40. I was saved under my dad's preaching on a Sunday night at the church back home. He preached the tap and the turnaround, the title of his sermon. That sermon saved, helped me to be saved that night. My testimony didn't hold anything to Jonah. And yet, Christ says, it's not about you. It's not about what you've gone through, what you've done. Christ says, keep your focus on me. Did you notice what's missing in this message that Jonah's to deliver? What is not there? It's not there, Jonah. Don't tell these people about the whale. Don't tell them your personal illustration. You know, have you ever told somebody that you got up in the morning and you said, you know, my back is just aching today. I, I went to bed, it was fine, but I got up and it was aching. And you know, and they start telling you, you know, the same thing happened to me right back here. Mine started hurting right. They try to one-up you. you, know. you oh, you, you understand one-up, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I thought the men were going to get into that yesterday. Well, I had two bears. I had three bears, you know. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. But yet, notice when people try to one-up you. Does it make you feel comforted? No. It's another spiritual gift. You've got to hold your tongue when they start one-upping. And, and the, the sad thing is, they think that they're helping you with their story. That you need to hear what I have to say because it will help you. I say, as the Bible says, keep our focus on Jesus and not on ourselves. Not on ourselves. Listen, what's the focus here? Jonah, you go and preach my word to these people. You go to Nineveh. Now, what did the Bible say about Nineveh? Geography again. Nineveh was uh, a great city that was founded by Nimrod. You know who Nimrod was? He was a great grandson of Noah. I missed that in my seminary question in school. I remember that now. I sure do. Nimrod and Nineveh. See the two ends that go together? I wish I'd have thought of that earlier. You know? But the city's about 60 miles in circumference. That's why it says it's a three days journey. It doesn't take you three days to get there. When you get there and to go from front to the back door it takes you three days. 
It's a big city. It's a big city. The population is about 600,000 in that day. The walls of Nineveh were wide enough that they had chariot races up on top of the wall. I think that's where Daytona 500 got started. What do you think? <laughs> right there on top of the wall. Bible scholars today think that perhaps that Nineveh is the present day city of Mosul there in northeast, northwest uh, Iraq. But look at verse 4. Jonah begins going throughout the city, and here's his sermon. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That is only eight words. Don't you wish I could preach eight words? You add that to the prayer list, and we'll see what happens, all right? But look at the word overturn. I want you to look at that word overturn or in, in, the, in the verse 4, the end of verse 4 there. That overturn means upside down. It, it, it means to, uh, to remember the total destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah completely turned upside down, where it is no more what it was. That's, that's what the word repentance means. Jonah was sent by God with a message from God to the people that God wants to be saved. Not only Jonah is given a second chance, but the people of Nineveh are given a second chance, and you and I are given a second chance too. God is giving us a second chance this morning. Jonah was moved by the word of God. What, what moves us? What moves us to action? See, that's, that's what love is. Remember what Paul says, faith, hope, love, but the greatest of these is love. Why is he talking about love being the greatest? Because love is what causes us to take action. It's what brought Jesus down from earth to save us from our sins. He loved us that much. He loved, God loved the Ninevites that much too. These mean, conquering people. Beloved, the real lesson here is when God says to go, He means it. He means it. God came a second time. Go to Nineveh. Could it be that God has asked you and me to go somewhere? To go to someone? It's not always about going international missions overseas. The Greek word for neighbor is not the person that lives down the street or behind you. The neighbor is the person standing beside you. The person standing beside you. That's your neighbor. And usually when that person's standing beside you, it's because our Lord's placed them there for us to speak to them. Beloved, as fun as it would be to take a cruise to Tarshish or, or to eat the light eater breakfast at Damon's, Nothing compares to doing the will of God. And if you want to experience true happiness and completeness in your life, do what God's asking you to do. Speak to someone about God. Do we need a second chance? Let's pray about it. Holy Spirit, right now, I just humbly ask that we allow you to speak to us that you give us the second chance now to hear your word. What can we do? First and foremost, if someone's here and they never believed in Jesus Christ, here's what we need to do first. Admit that we believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord, that I am a sinner, I have sinned, by not obeying his call to come. I believe now that he died on the cross and rose again. And he is asking me to come to be his follower. I commit my life to Jesus Christ as the Christian. You come first. But maybe you've already prayed your sinner's prayer long ago. And you want to, you, you just feel the Holy Spirit leading you to rededicate your walk. I want you to come. Jesus loves us. He loves people. And people want to know that Jesus loves them. And beloved, you and I right here in this sanctuary have a message to tell them of the love of Jesus. 
Maybe you want to come and commit yourself to that. Or whatever the Lord's laying on your heart, this would be a good time to come. We just trust in the loving name of our Lord and Savior that we'll be obedient to that calling. In His precious name we pray. Amen. In these times of uncertainty today, Severin Church would like to remind everyone that you can still tithe on the church website, www.severinchurch.faith, or email your tithes to Severin Church, 9066 Robins Neck Road, Gloucester, Virginia, 23061. Thank you for your generosity.